us flow, and we thank you yes. for calling the nation and calling the whole world yes. for the return yes. that was uh, put on yesterday and this whole weekend in Washington, D.C. And we just pray, Lord, that we would return to you, us yes. as individuals, yes. us as a church, us as a nation, and an entire world, that we would put aside other gods and that we would return to you. And we thank you, Lord, for this promise that we just sang out of Isaiah. We just proclaim it for this congregation yes. in Jesus' name. Amen.
tongue will confess that he is Lord. We pray now, Father, that as we move into um, studying your words, just speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, they did good. Everybody take one
is the same word uh, in Greek is the word meno, meno, meno. And it means to set out. Uh, or another way, I like to use the phrase to make it your dwelling. And the idea being you're planted there. You're, you're not moving. You're not going to go with the wind, whichever way the wind's blowing. You're not going to go with it. You are firmly planted. And that's what Jesus said we need to be. We need to be firmly planted in him. Now, if we're firmly planted in him, that's when we get to experience the life that he promised to give us. That's when you get to experience the portion of life instead of putting it around town. I don't know about you, but if I had a brand new portion, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be going to speed limit very often. That's why I don't have one. That and how much they cost. But, you know, that because I know what that thing's designed for. We can put it in our context. A new Corvette with a large V8. I mean, that thing wasn't designed to go 50. That thing was designed to, to let it get out there on the road and let it ride. Well, Jesus understood that within every person there's this longing not only for connection with God, but there's this longing to experience a better quality of life than what we are experiencing at the moment. And that's what motivates a lot of people to do some of the crazy things they do. You know, it's kind of like adrenaline junkies. They, they have to do something wild and, and, and risky in order to feel like they're alive. Well, Jesus wants us to feel like we're alive without jumping off buildings and and crazy stuff like that. Because that's the way he designed life to work. So if you look in John 15, it said, it, we'll begin in verse 1. I am the true vine. And again, remember we said last week, that's opposed to false vines. That there are other ways that are offered out there today and were then that promise to connect people with God. And there's only one way. And, that, and we cannot compromise on that and as one of the points where the greatest pressure is being applied today is the exclusive claims of the gospel Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me now when you tell people that they get angry about it you can always tell them well, I didn't write it I'm just quoting, but it's still true. There's only one way. And so Jesus said, I am the, the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now, remember the word cuts off means to take away, like you would cut something, a branch, and take it away. It also is, is used in the context of lifting up which was a common practice in that day. If you had a branch on a vine that was weak and laid on the ground, they would pick it up and they would tie it off to a stronger branch. And they would leave it there until the weak branch was strong enough to hold itself up and then they would untie it. So there is the taking away. There's also the lifting up. Now, God does both. And if you want to look in context, though, what is he talking about here? When he says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, in context, he's talking about Israel. <clears throat> because if you look where Paul deals with this, uh, Paul says that Gentiles should not get arrogant about the fact that they've received the gospel. Because if, if God was willing to cut off the natural vine, which was Israel, and he grabbed a wild olive branch, which was us, don't think that if we go into unbelief, he won't cut us off when he cut them off. But rejoice, just think about the day and how wonderful it'll be when they are grafted back into the vine. So in, in strict context here, he's probably referring to Israel. But we see a principle here that applies to us. There are times in our lives where we may be that weak branch and he has to lift us up and tie us off with somebody stronger than us. He, 
he connects us with somebody. And, and you can sense the bond you have with them. And it may not be an eternal bond. I mean, it may just be for a season, and then stuff, you know, stuff happens, and they end up going their way, and you end up going yours. But you're stronger because you were connected to them. All right. Um, now, so he lifts up every branch that bears no fruit, and again, fruit being the evidence of the nature of God within us, or we might say the fruits of the Spirit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he gives a pass. Oh, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, and the word there is repeated. I wish it was just a once in a lifetime thing, but it's not. He prunes repeatedly. Now, what is it that's involved in pruning? When, when the, the pruning took place, they would remove the excess growth or the dead branches, the dead and diseased branches. Now, excess, excess growth would be um, shoots and things that came off the branches that never produced anything. All they did was draw the life out of the branch. For example, we got rose bushes at home that we cannot kill. We tried, and, and they just keep blooming. Well, if we don't prune them back, and we haven't in a while, if we don't prune them back, those things just grow up this high. And when they get up this high, they have very few roses on them. Now, a few years ago, we got enough of it, and Danita got out there, and she cut those things down to the ground just about. And we had limbs everywhere that had been cut off. And, but she got it right back down to where it came out of the dirt. Those little bitty limbs sticking up. And when those things bloomed, all you could see was roses. Because we had pruned off the excess growth. All that excess growth may look wonderful, but it's worthless. Now, do we ever let some worthless things get into our lives? Maybe, that, maybe it's not bad in and of itself. It's not a sinful thing. But it's things that are distracting us from better things. It's things that are hindering the fruit production in our lives. Might be too busy. It might be we get all wrapped up in some kind of activities and, and that don't amount to anything, but we get all wrapped up in it. And God said, you're, you're distracting from your fruitfulness because you're giving your energy to something that isn't necessarily bad, but it's bad for you. And that's where we get into convictions. And we had a lot of fun last week talking about the conviction you shouldn't drink a Coke. And everybody doesn't have that conviction. Not everyone. There's no verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not drink Coke. But God may speak to you and say, You need to cut back on those. You're drinking too many. In fact, don't drink anymore. Well, that's right. It's going to take a call from heaven to make that happen. But it, it, it may be that we that God speaks to you and says, you know, this thing that's in part of your life has got to go. And that's when we say, but, 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 but. No buts. It has to go. Well, it's not fair. We always get the fair, though. I used to say only fair in life comes to town in November. Well, we don't even get that this year. And no peace. But we always get to the no. Well, it's no fair. God, why, why is it I can't drink a Coke, but you'll let Mark drink all the Cokes he wants? In fact, to even make it worse, he'll drink them in front of me. Now, we usually start off there. 
And then the next step is to assume, well, if I can't drink them, you shouldn't drink them. And if you're drinking them, that means you're not spiritual. You're living in sin. You see where that goes? When, it, when all along, that was just God pruning something in my life that was draining away from fruitfulness. All right, so he prunes so that it will become so that it will be more fruitful. You, verse 3, are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Verse 4. Remain in me. Now notice how many times he uses that word remain. Remain in me. Again, what does it mean? Make me your dwelling. Be settled. Let me be the foundation. Don't go with the wind. Stay right here. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Oh, so not only does he say we should be settled in him, but he's saying I'm going to be settled in you. We got some assurance there. We got some security there. We got an anchor there. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So if we're going to bear the fruit that God desires, the only way that happens is if we're settled in Christ. It's not going to happen if we're out here doing our own thing. For those who missed Sunday school, we talked about uh, you know, it, it's a common thing now for people to try to social distance from God. They got the ticket to heaven. Uh, they just want to get that punch so they can get in there one day and get on, put on their golden slippers. And whatever it takes to get that, that's about the extent of their Christianity. So they try to be good folks. They go to church. They do all the religious things and go through the formalities. But there's no fellowship with God. There's no remaining in Christ. There's just, I bought my ticket and now I'm, I'm ready to use it when the time comes and I'm going to try to be a good enough person that God will come along and take it back. And that's not remaining. And that's why that kind of life is so empty. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do a lot. Nothing. Nothing. Now, that nothing there has to do with fruit. Okay? So we can do nothing. I, I like to use the phrase, we can do nothing of redemptive value. Because we can do something apart from Christ. We make a big mess. We can get in the flesh, do all kind of damage to people. We can do a lot that way. But we can do nothing of redemptive value if we're not settled in Christ. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now, we talked about this last week, that the tendency a lot of times is to say, well, he's talking about hell there. Well, actually, if we're going to stick with context, he's talking about what they did with the dead branches. They made bonfires with them because they burned quick and hot and they were easy to light. So you could, I guess, if you wanted to use hell and stick it in there, but I like to think of it also, if we kind of keep it with the flow of what he's saying, is those who refuse, or who don't remain in Christ, about the last thing they're good for is to serve as a warning and an example of what not to do. That's the only purpose they have left, and that's the purpose of this. Uh, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, now this is the one we like, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So pray about that motorcycle. That's what I used to. I, boy, I, I sent up a lot of prayers to Adam John because I sure did want one of those motorcycles real bad. And I made all kinds of promises. And this is one of the verses I claimed. But it didn't work. Verse 8. 
This is to my Father's glory, that ye bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So what shows us to be his disciples? That we're bearing fruit. People, when they're around us, ought to be able to pick up there's something different. And not because we're weird, but because they sense there's a different nature at work in us than is at work in them. And you shouldn't have to put on the side of your man. I'm a Christian. You know, I always get nervous when I'm behind folks and they got bumper stickers all over their car about how spiritual they are, what great Christians they are. Honk if you love Jesus and, and all those things. And when you honk, they give you the finger. <laughs> and uh, we don't have to do that if we're producing fruit. As my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and will remain in his love. I've told you this, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now who is he talking to there? To the disciples. You guys... Hold on to this. You need to love each other. Just like I've loved you. Because he understood it wasn't going to be that long from this occasion when they're going to scatter. When Jesus is arrested, they scatter. But after the resurrection, they come back together. And Jesus has to actually, if you remember sitting by the, when he's sitting by the lake and they have the meal together, he actually brings them back together as a cohesive unit. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you. That word appointed, important word, and we'll talk about that again in just a second. But it has to do with being set or planted somewhere. That he has set us in this world where he wants us to be fruitful. We'll touch on that again in a minute. But I've appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. We love to produce fruit that will last. You know, we're not talking about going to uh, youth camp fruit here. You know, we used to the kids go to youth camp. Well, they were, when they get them to that last night, they were all confessed up and saved up. And, and boy, they're making promises. God, I'm ready to go to the Congo. I'll never do what I used to do. I'm going to be the... I'm going to be the Billy Graham at my school. And, 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 they, and they come home and they're on cloud nine spiritually. Only problem is by the end of the next week, they're not up on cloud nine anymore. The fruit didn't last. But God wants us to have fruit in our life that lasts, that remains. Why? So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And this is my command. Love each other. So I want to say a few things about that word remain. The way, the way the word is used in the passage is really, you can go two ways. One way is he's the only, we remain in him because he's the only way of salvation. Okay, so that would go back to the part about cutting off Israel. It also speaks to the fact that there no other religion is going to bring you to the Father. Jesus is it. And we've got to be sold on that. We, we've got to be firm on that. We can't compromise on that. Because if we do, then we're just going to be like everybody else. We cannot compromise on the gospel because it's true. Well, that's one application of it is Applies to salvation. The other one 
has to do with fellowship, or I call it a vibrant union. Remaining means we are intentional in fulfilling our part in maintaining intimacy with Christ. You see, he doesn't do it all for us. He does what he has to do that we can't do in the relationship, but he gives us some things to do too. We have to make the commitment. Think about marriage. If you have two people get married and, and the uh, husband tells the wife, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of be here. I'm going to let you kind of carry the relationship for us. And uh, I'm just going to kind of be tagging along. Is that going to work? No. There won't be any intimacy there because it takes both working together. Same is true with God. There's things that only God can do in this relationship and, and setting us up to have a relationship with him. But then we have a role to play in that as well. For example, if you're going to be intimate with somebody, you've got to spend time with them. Correct? You have to spend time with them. Well, God may give us that, that yearning, that drawing to spend time with him, but we may say, no, I'd rather go watch the news. Is he going to grab your arm and pull you towards him? No. He forfeited that opportunity. So there is, in remaining, there is that fellowship, and we have a part to play in that fellowship. One part is to live in submission to Christ and to seek to live in a way that brings pleasure to him. If we will remain, if we will maintain this relationship over time, the natural outcome is the production of fruit. See, the more time you spend with him, the more like him you become. So what does Jesus promise about remaining in him? Here's what God promises about that life and how he designed life to be lived for those who are willing to remain in Christ. Number one, we will be pruned but not cut off. We will be pruned, but not cut off. Number two, we will be fruitful and bring glory to God. You know, there's something within us that wants to be fruitful. In fact, we're born with the desire to prove we can do stuff. We want attention. We want to prove our ability to do stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, Alfred Adler was one of the people who popularized this idea of being bored with an innate sense of insecurity. And to overcome that, infants and small children try to learn to master things that will not only give them some attention, but will give them the sense of satisfaction that they have, can accomplish something. They can achieve something. So there's something within us, in the design of God within us, that wants to be fruitful. Well, the good news is if we remain in Christ, we will be. His word will remain in us because the word comes with him. So he mentions there the importance of the word being in us, not just knowing about it, but being in us and part of us. Our prayers are answered because his word is cleansing us. His word is cleansing us. Most of the time, the pruning that we're going to experience in life is going to come from the Word. You'll be reading, you'll hear it, something will be said, and, and the Lord will speak to you and say, that's for you. Much of the time, that's the way it's going to happen. Another thing he said is we can experience his love and share that love with each other. We are called the friends of God. That's a pretty good one. If we remain in him, we experience the joy of being planted by God where we can be most fruitful and have lasting fruit in our lives. Now that brings us to that word appointed. Appointed means, again, to set something somewhere or somebody somewhere. And it was used, Paul used it when describing setting uh, Timothy into a position in the church. He used it in relation to church elders. And it has to do with an assignment. 
or to fulfill a purpose. Here's the thing. God has a purpose for all of us. And he has an assignment for all of us. You see, God designed that we be planted in certain places. And when we uh, go along with that, when we remain in him and we cooperate with what he's doing, when we're planted where he wants us to be planted is when we're the most fruitful. Now, does that mean we're going to stay there? Sometimes God not move you. Sometimes we move ourselves. Sometimes we like to yank our roots up and we say, I'm going to run down the road where it's a lot easier. I'm going to pop my roots down there. And then we're there for a little while and say, oh, I don't like it here anymore. I'm going to pull my roots up and I'm going to run over here. I'll pop my roots down here. And we're, and we're just constantly. It's like if I planted a pecan tree this winter and every month I went out and dug it up and moved it. What's going to happen to that tree eventually? It's going to die because I'm not given enough time for the roots to set for the tree. God's got somewhere for all of us to be planted. You need to let your roots get established there. Because when you do, in that place, you're going to be most fruitful. Now that's part of remaining in Christ. We've been appointed. If you look at verse 16 again, we've been appointed. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of fruit I want to produce. I don't want to get in the rut of saying, boy, back in the 80s, whew, I had all kinds of fruit in my life. Oh, boy, the, I had a, all kinds of evidence that the Spirit of God was in me. Really? What about now? Well, not so much now. But back in the 80s, I had it going on. The only problem was whatever I had in the 80s wasn't lasting fruit. And that could be for a number of reasons. But usually it's because I've chosen to distance myself from the Lord. And when we do, we're not remaining. And what happens if you don't remain in Him? You can do nothing. No fruit. So today I want to ask us, how's our fruit? How's the fruit? It, it, now, I know we look at each other and say, well, I, see, I just see good fruit everywhere. Because we're going to do that. We don't want to be the one to say, well, you've got some rotten fruit in your life. <laughs> now, John D. might do that, but most of us <laughs> don't do that. You know, so we would just try to encourage each other and just ignore that rotten stuff. And say, oh, I just see good fruit everywhere. But what if a lost person were to assess the fruit in our lives? What would they say? Would they say, man, I don't know what it is about you, but there's something different about you, and I want that. Or would they say, you're a what? Really? I'd have never known if you hadn't told me. You see, we're living in a day now where people don't care about your words that much. You know, when you say, well, I want to share the gospel with you. And it's what you, what you got to do. You believe this much. They want to see proof. That, that what we're saying actually works. So how's our fruit? Chances are, and I throw myself here on this, chances are we've got a lot of good fruit, 
but then we got a couple of branches that consistently produce bad fruit. If that's the case, what do we do with that? We go to the master gardener and say, Lord, I know I know there's a couple areas in my life that the fruit's not good, had not been good in a long time. I repent. And I ask you, this is going to be part of it, to do the pruning job you've got to do so that I can produce good fruit in that part of my life too. See, it's the fruit that makes the difference. I'll never forget this, and for all I know, he said it to everybody up there, but I doubt it. But when I graduated from high school, me and Abe Lincoln walked out all together. When I graduated from high school, I had a teacher tell me one day, he said, you're the only true Christian I've seen in this place. And he was lost. I, I knew his background. He, was, he went to church occasionally, you know, Easter Lily, Christmas wreath, and that was about it. But he said, you're the only true Christian I've seen up here. I said, what? He said, you're the only one who your words match your life. Would we hear that today? How's your food? The good news is the master gardener is available. And if the fruit hasn't been that good, he can do what only he can do to make it right. You see, remember, he's the one who prunes, not us. We have to let him do it because he knows how to do it. Right. Now, Danita went through Master Gardener class. She knows how to prune stuff. Me, I just go there and whack it off. And that's not the way to do it all the time. She knows. We've got a Master Gardener who knows how to prune. So we just go to him and say, Lord, do what you got to do. But I want good fruit. And you see, when we're doing that, and we're remaining in Christ, we begin to experience the life that God designed from the beginning. And instead of putting it around town, we're like that portion on the altar. Because when it was going 230, whatever it was, it was doing what it was designed to do. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have designed all of us to be in a remaining relationship with you. And if we'll do it, the fruit will come. And Lord, I pray that just as you promised, not only will we produce fruit, but it'll be lasting fruit. And so, Lord, help us to examine our lives today and to be honest. And where we see things, where we are, may see a lot of good fruit, and we can be thankful for that, there's probably some branches where the fruit's not so good. Help us, Lord, to cooperate with you as you do your pruning work. Because we do want to produce good fruit. We do want to be the kind of people that would, when people look at us, they say there's something different about you. And I don't know what it is, but I want it. And 
Lord, I thank you. And I, and I pray, Lord, that, that um, you'll help us learn to cooperate with where it is you've appointed us to be and to not be uh, guilty of thinking that we're free agents and we just run around and plant ourselves wherever we want. But it's you who determines where we fit. So, Lord, I pray your blessing on each family that's here today, on each person that's here today. And I pray their souls, that they'll prosper and be in health as their souls prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Uh, start raining again. Hope you have a great day, great week. We're going to shoot for baptism Sunday week. So, hopefully, it won't be freezing cold. It won't. Linda's prophesying it won't. So we'll see if she's a real prophet or not. Have a great week, everyone.